I'm going to read a passage of scripture in anticipation of the passage that we're going to preach from today. And it's also found in Corinthians, but in the second book of Corinthians, the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And, and uh, chapter 11, beginning with verse 21. And uh, I want to, as we read this, I want you to keep asking yourself, what in the world would motivate a guy like Paul to endure the things that he endured in order to preach the gospel? Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the question I want you to ask as we read through here. What in the world would motivate a guy like Paul? Now, a Paul, extremely intelligent, well-educated, could have been a leader amongst the Pharisees, uh, chose not to do that because when he met Christ, God, uh, he changed his life completely. Uh, Christ changed his life completely. And so again, why would he, have to, why would he endure all the things that he endured? Um, knowing that he was not going to quit, it was going to be that way for the rest of his life, he's going to do that. What would motivate him to endure all of that in order to preach the gospel? Okay, so let's read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 21. You can just listen up if you want. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, where in soever any is bold, I, spoke, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. You know why they... They beat you 39 times and not 40, right? 40 was supposed to kill you. So they just took one away so we, they, you just suffered from it, okay? Uh, so how many times? Uh, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters in perils of robbers, in perils my, of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and besides all of those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak, and who is offended, and I burn not. So what in the world would possess a guy like the Apostle Paul to endure all those things and to know that he's going to continue to have to endure those things? As a matter of fact, when Paul was converted, while he was still in the city of Damascus, Ananias was sent to him to tell him uh, 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 what had happened to him on the road to Damascus, to explain that to him. And when God called Ananias to go tell uh, Paul about those things, he said, you, you, you've got to tell him about me, and you have to tell him all of the things that he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. And so Paul had that to look forward to the rest of his life. Now, what in the world would, would put yourself in his position and ask yourself if you would continue to be uh, the faithful uh, sharer of the gospel, knowing that that's the way your life is going to be from now on? You're going to be beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, uh, beaten with rods, beaten with whips, uh, 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 suffering hunger and thirst. You're going to do all of that. Are you willing to do that? And what, if you are, what would motivate you to do so? I think the Bible, in the same, in the same, when Paul wrote to the same group of people on another occasion, in uh, First Corinthians, or actually in Second Corinthians, a little bit earlier, in uh, in that letter, he explains why he would endure all of those things. Okay, He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Um, what motivated Paul? It says, The love of Christ constrains me. Now, we, I read that phrase and I ask myself, what does that mean? Is it the love that Christ has for me? that keeps me motivated? Well, yeah, that, could, that would explain it. Or is it the love that Christ has for other people that keeps me motivated? 
Uh, I have a tendency to think that it was the latter of, of, of the two. It was the latter that, that Paul was referring to. It's the love that Christ has for the world that motivates me to make sure that they get to hear the gospel. And the reason I say that is because of the second part of that verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. This is, what we, this is the way we think. If one died for all, then we're all dead. So the love of Christ constrains me, knowing that all, are, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death. Knowing all of that is true, I'm motivated to make sure that they get to hear the gospel that gives them a brand new life. Okay? So, uh, the love of Christ constrains us to be passionately in love with a lost world. And that motivates us to share the gospel regardless of the price that we have to pay. Now, guys, I, uh, uh, I want to point out one other thing that's true of the Apostle Paul. Uh, not only was he motivated by the love of Christ for, the, for a lost world to endure all those sufferings, he actually said, I would be willing, I myself would be willing to be accursed from Christ to be a curse from Christ I would go to hell for all of my kinsmen according to the flesh if my kinsmen the Jewish nation would come to know Christ as their Savior if I died and went to hell if that was a sacrifice that was needed I would be willing to do that in order for them to come to know Jesus as their Savior now I don't know very many people who love that passionately but I want you to uh, and I want to be that kind of a person that loves so passionately. Now, I'll, I'll thank the Lord, and it, it's all according to Him. Thank the Lord that I won't have to, because He's already given me uh, that eternal life, that place in heaven that He's preparing for me. But the fact is, I, uh, I would still like to have the passion that Paul had in making sure and having the kind of, of desire to see people come to know Jesus as, as Paul had, had, even to the point of being willing to be accursed from Christ. Um, that, happened, that hasn't happened a whole lot in my life, that I've had that kind of passion about people. But uh, I, I know one thing, that uh, it's Christ's passion and the love of Christ constrains me. It drives me. It pushes me. That's what Paul is saying. I'm not saying that. Uh, even though I wish it was true in my own life. It's that passion that Christ has for people to come to know Christ that impels him and pushes him. As a matter of fact, the, the word that's used there, the original language of the Bible, uh, was, is also used to describe what happens when cowboys are herding cows. Uh, it, the love of Christ herds me hurts me, it pushes me, it, it, it compels me, it, it obligates me uh, to, to share the, the gospel in spite of all that I have to endure in, in doing so. The love of Christ. Okay. Now let's turn to the passage that we're going to study today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. 
Whether there are tongues, they will be stilled. Whether there is where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the childhood behind me, the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The emphasis of our sermons in the last few weeks, and will be continue to be so, is that some things never change. And the time that we live in nowadays, when everything is changing or is about to, uh, there are some things that never change. And the one thing that we want to talk about today is the one thing that never, or one of the things that never changes, is love. Faith, love, and hope abide. These remain, but the greatest of these is love. Um, love never fails, it says in verse 8. Let me tell you some things that do fail. Uh, verses 1 and 2. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, I'm going to skip that part and go say, I am, I am nothing. We can talk about that other section in just a second. Okay? So if, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and don't have love, I am a sounding, resounding gong and a, chain, and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and fathom all the mysteries and knowledge, and don't have love, uh, I'm, I'm nothing. Um, this is what I'm going to make some of you mad at me. Out there, you guys, and maybe some of you here, I don't think so. But um, If you speak in tongues and don't have love, the Bible says that you're a clanging symbol and, and a sounding brass and clanging symbol at your best. Uh, I'm not doubting the gift. I know that some people do. But I want you to know something. If you have that gift, and you are not passionately in love with people that you're trying to win to Christ, you are a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Uh, Paul said, the thing that motivates me more than any other thing to make sure that the world gets to hear the gospel is the love of Christ. It compels me, it pushes me, it, it herds me to those people who don't know Jesus as their Savior. And yes, I speak with tongues. So what? That doesn't help me a bit unless I'm speaking in a language that people can understand the gospel in. And if I don't love those people, then I'm not going to, it's not going to be that big a deal. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blabbermouth. <laughs> um, and that is, is the best I can say about me if I speak in tongues and don't have love. If the love of Christ compels me, and I am passionately in love with him, even, even to the point of wanting, of being willing to give my soul to make sure that they get to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel, then I'm sounding brass and tinkling simple. Um, I don't like to talk about it like that, but uh, uh, I'm kind of like James. You show me. You show me your faith. Uh, uh, you show me your faith. I will show you my faith in, in, in my works. I am impelled to share the gospel because of the love of Jesus. And all of these things that I might do that I claim to be gifted in if they don't motivate me more to love, then I'm just a sounding brass and a tinkling suit. So don't glorify the gift. Glorify the giver. And um, because if I don't have love, that's all I am. It's just a sounding brass and a tinkling suit. 
Um, and it doesn't matter if it's speaking in tongues or any of the other gifts, because the part that we didn't read in verse 2 uh, says, and if I have faith that can move mountains, and I don't have love, I'm nothing. Um, um, let me ask you a question. What do you see as a good definition of the word faith? Let me give you some examples and see if we can't come to a, an understanding of what faith really is. Once upon a time, Jesus was in the area of Tyre and Sidon, up in the very northern part of Israel, in Lebanon these days, right? Uh, and uh, while he was there, there was a lady who came and told him, said, my daughter is possessed of a demon. Uh, would you come and help her? And he ignored her. But she kept begging him and kept following him until the disciples say, send her away. She's, she's bugging us. And, uh, and, and she pled again, my, please help me. And uh, Jesus says, I've, I've come to the house of Israel. I've not come to give what is for the children to the dogs. And she says in the most incredible way, the most humble of sweet spirits, she says, yes, you're right, Lord. But even the dogs under the table get to eat of the, of the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. <laughs> and again, it's one of those occasions where I get the impression that Jesus went, oh, oh my, oops. <laughs> I, I've never seen all of that kind of faith. I've never seen that kind of faith. And it just blows him away. And she, he says, go your way. It's, it's, it's taken care of. And, and he, she went home and found her, her, her daughter healed. Uh, a lady who did not have the law. She didn't know what the Bible said. A lady who didn't have all the Jewish traditions. She didn't know about all of those things. She was a Syrophoenician woman. She didn't have all of those privileges that the Jewish people had. And yet she understood. She understood that Jesus could heal her daughter. Uh, there was a, a Roman centurion stationed in Israel with a group of uh, with a hundred soldiers underneath him to make sure that they kept the peace and, and, uh, and, and, and remained faithful to the, to the Roman government. But he loved Israel. Um, and his servant was sick, and he loved his servant. And so he called the elders of the Jews and sent them to Jesus, saying, Have him come and, and heal my servant. And so the, the elders of the Jews came to Jesus and they said, the centurion has a servant that he loves and, he's, and his servant is sick. And he's asking us to come and beseech you to come back with us and, and heal his servant. He's a good man. He deserves your attention if you don't mind. Um, he deserves it because he's built us a synagogue and he loves our country. Come and help him. And as Jesus was on the way, the centurion heard that Jesus was on the way and sent another servant to Jesus and says, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not worthy for you to be under my roof. Uh, I'm not worthy for you to be in my home. But I understand what authority means, because I am a man of authority. I tell one man to do this, and he does that. I tell another to do something else, and he does that. And I know that all you have to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, this is an impossible situation. This guy was on his deathbed. And Jesus heard uh, what that man, what the centurion said about him not being worthy to be under his he was not worthy to have Jesus under his roof. And, and again, it's one of those cases where, oh, man, where did that come from? You're a Roman. Again, you don't have the, the, the Bible. You don't have the Old Testament. You don't have the law, the prophets. You don't have any of that. You don't have any of our traditions. How do you know? Uh, 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 how, do you, how do you have faith when even my own Jewish people don't have it? As a matter of fact, he said that. He says, uh, uh, I've not found this kind of faith, no, not in all of Israel. Two people, the Syrophoenician woman and the centurion, and not just those two, but others we can talk about in the scriptures too, uh, understood and, uh, uh, and had faith that God could heal their people that they loved. Um, another occasion when Jesus was with his disciples. He just got through, maybe a day or two before, feeding 4,000 people with, how many fish and loaves was it this case? Uh, like seven, I think. Seven, seven fish and some loaves. Um, he had fed 4,000 people with, with just a 
just a pan full of food. And uh, by the way, those weren't king salmon. <laughs> <laughs> they were what perch about this long. You know, they they weren't big fish at all. Um, uh, and they got in the boat and they went over the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the disciples were thinking, "Oh shoot, we forgot to bring bread." And Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, uh, begins to teach them anyway. He says, "Beware the leaven of the Pharisees," and they're thinking, "Oh no." He's getting on to us because we forgot to bring bread, leaven. Okay, we forgot to bring bread, now he's, now he's on our case. And Jesus, again, knowing what they're thinking, said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, the, the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But he says, O ye, o ye of little faith. I just got through feeding 4,000 men and their wives and kids with seven fish. And you're worried about not bringing bread? Don't you get it yet? <laughs> so in, with two people that he didn't expect to find faith, he found it. But with his own disciples who he expected to understand a little bit more about what was going on, uh, he didn't find faith. Oh, ye yeah, of little faith, he said. And he's always looking for that. He's always looking for faith. And matter of fact, faith is one of those things that's going to abide forever. But if your faith is the kind of faith that can move mountains and you don't love, then it's useless. If your faith is the kind that can move mountains and you don't love, then you're not going to use it for what I want you to use it for. If you don't love, you're not using the, your gifts like you, like you should. If you don't love, and if you don't have a passionate love for somebody, and you know it just may be for your son or your daughter or your cousin or your aunt or uncle or grandpa or grandma, I don't care who it's for, it may be for an entire people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever loved anybody the way I love my Chinese grandchildren. All 400 of them. <laughs> If you want to hear that story, I'll tell you. If y'all hadn't heard it yet, I'll tell you that story sometime. But the fact is, I just can't stand the thought of them going to hell. I just can't stand the thought of them being separated from God for eternity in a place that was not meant for them. Hell is meant for the devil and his angels. It's not meant for people. And yet people are going there and deciding to go there. And, and not even, even because they don't understand they're going there. And... and, and and even if I had faith that could move mountains and speak in every tongue and language or unknown and heavenly and, and earthly and don't have love for those folks, now I'm, a, I'm sounding brass and tinkling simple. I, uh, I'm nothing, the Bible tells me. I'm nothing. Maybe, maybe God can give me the gift of Chinese. <laughs> um, this is kind of a side, it doesn't have anything to do with the sermon today, but I was in, a, in, in, in uh, uh, Beijing with some friends, uh, and we were walking along this big plaza, and there were literally, folks, if you've ever been to a city in China, there are thousands and thousands of people around you all the time, if you're ever out in public. And, um, and as we were walking along, going to a restaurant to have dinner, there was this couple that were taking pictures of their elderly father. And um, when they saw me, they asked me if I would pose with him and have my picture, have that picture made with the two of us together. I guess they thought I was elderly too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I posed and then took the pictures and, and we were visiting and finally the lady kind of stands back like this and looks at me and she says, are you a missionary? And I said, not in China. <laughs> and she said, but, but, and I told her, I said, but I am a believer. And if I get a chance, I, I, you know, and, and I, I, I share the gospel. I didn't say I have to get a chance. I used that phrase a little bit later on in our conversation. And so we talked about that for a little while. And finally I said, listen, there are two young ladies over here. I've been witnessing with them. And uh, I think it would be really good for them to hear the gospel in their language. And their heart language. I said, so if you get a chance, and that's, why I, that's the way I expressed it, if you get a chance 
talk with him about Jesus. And she looked at me and she says, this is my tent. And she went right over. And began to talk to them about the Lord. That's what I'm talking about to you guys. The love to see another person come to know Jesus as Savior. And if we don't have that kind of love, all of our gifts of the Spirit are useless. Do you hear that? Mm-hmm. All of our gifts of the Spirit are useless. We might be able to speak every language under the sun and move mountains by our faith. But if we don't have love, we are sounding brass, tingling symptoms, we're nothing. Um, see why I think I'm probably going to make people mad at me today. Because uh, all the gifts of the Spirit, the faith that can move mountains, and even in verse 3 we see, uh, uh, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, then I may boast and do not have love, I gain nothing. A generation, or a generosity, excuse me, that helps the poor. If I have the generosity that helps the poor and don't love those poor people, I, uh, I'm nothing, the Bible says. I gain nothing. It's interesting, I'm going through a premarital counseling session with a couple of friends of mine, and, and uh, um, uh, we, we try to cover all the topics that cause divorce. You know, things like finances, for one thing. And so that's what we talked about last time. About who's going to handle it, and how they're going to handle it, and on, how they're going to work on a budget, and how they're going to set goals in their budget, and all that kind of stuff. We talked about all those things. And, and the guy says, you know, I've always wanted to be generous, but in my particular occupation, I'm never going to have enough money to be able to give generously. And uh, uh, so he was kind of disappointed that he was not going to be the kind of generous person that, he's, that so many people have been, uh, like, like so many people who have been generous with him. And so he, uh, he shared that a little bit, and I said, I'll tell you what you do. Uh, do you tithe? He said, well, yeah, I, I tithe. I said, next year, you begin giving 10.5% instead of 10. And that half percent, you put in a jar somewhere and hide it. And don't touch it. Don't touch it. And then the next year, you increase it another half percent. The year after that, you give 11%. And after that, 11 and a half. And after that, 12. And you give an extra half a percent until Jesus tells you you can stop. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of a, a uh, it's convenience store chain called Allsup's. You ever heard of Allsup's? Uh, it's mostly a, a, a southern thing, most of a southeast, southwestern southern thing, Texas, uh, uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma, in that area. Uh, that's what he started. He, the guy lived in, in Clovis, Texas when he started the first officers. And he made a commitment to live on 10 and a, 10 and a half percent and then 11 until God told him he could quit. And he's not the only person who did it. There's a lot of other examples of people who've done that. And eventually he got to the point where he had a chain, he had the chain store with all these convenience stores and he was living on 10 percent and giving God 90 percent. Uh, the guy who, who started the the the, is it Caterpillar or yeah, Eternal School? Yeah. Uh, that's what he did as well. And so uh, I, that's what I talk to him about. You can you can be generous. Uh, you just have to figure out a system that you can do it and stick with it until you have the kind of resources that that uh, you can use to be generous. But don't just be generous for generosity's sake. Don't just be generous so, so people say, yeah, you know. Uh, Kyle gives 12% of his, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Don't, don't be generous for generosity's sake. Because if you don't have love, you're nothing. You can give all of your possessions to the poor. Uh, you can give over your body to hardship that you can boast. But if you don't have love, you gain nothing. You don't get anything from it. You may be giving away millions and not get anything from it because you don't love the people you're giving it to. Love is the enduring thing, you guys. It's the one thing that Jesus is looking for in our lives. All the gifts of the Spirit, tongues of angels and of men, if you don't have love, you're a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. 
If you have faith to move mountains and don't have love, you're nothing, the Bible says. If you have the generosity that helps the poor, and you don't love those poor people, you're nothing. And as a matter of fact, it goes on to say there in verse 3, uh, to give my body over to hardship, just like Paul did in the passage that we read earlier. And if you don't have love, even to the point of martyrdom, you can give up and give, give, up, give your body up. But if you don't have love, I, I don't want to hear about it. It don't mean anything to me. Because you're giving to get praise of men, or you're giving to, to soothe your own conscience, or you're giving for a lot of different reasons, because if you really loved and gave, then that would be a different story. That would be a completely different story. Okay? So, what is the one thing that never changes when everything else around this is that we talked about today? It's love. That's never going to change. And that's always going to be the standard by which uh, Jesus measures our actions. Why are you doing this? Why are you speaking in tongues? Why are you prophesying? Why are you giving your, your even your body? Uh, uh, why are you um, uh, have, why do you have faith? Why do you give all that you possess to the poor? You give your body to hardship. Why do you do all of that? It's not motivated by love. Sounding brass, thinking simple. You're nothing. So I'm not telling that you're nothing. What I'm telling you is, you guys find something, find someone to passionately love. Okay? Find something to passionately love. Someone to passionately love. Some people to passionately love. Um, a few years ago in the Baptist Convention in Alaska, we sent out a list of all of the villages in Alaska that did not have anybody to tell them about Jesus. They could hear it on the radio or see it on television. But for the most part, there was no local person to, uh, to lead uh, people to Jesus in those, in those towns. Uh, it was a list of a hundred villages. And we challenged our churches to just pick one out. Just pick one out. I can't think of one now. I wish I could. And then begin to pray for them. Uh, the uh, Big Lake Baptist Church did this. And did a great job. And now they're still involved in a lot of, 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 of village ministry. Uh, and they began to pray for that. And it's kind of interesting. Did you all know I drive a 2010 Ford Escape? In 2010, when I, when I bought that car, I didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> a silver... 2010 Ford Escape. Really, I didn't know the Ford made the Escape. Uh, but I bought one, and that's all I saw <laughs> from then on. You know, every time I see one now, I see a silver 2010 Ford Escape <laughs> because I've got one. You know, how you that? Figure that out. That, that works that way somehow. I don't know how that works, but it, it does. And the same thing happened with those with those those uh, villages that they were praying for. Suddenly, that's all they heard. Every person they, they, every native person that they saw came from that village. Or everything that came out in the news was about that village. Or everything that everybody was talking about in conversation was about that village. And that's what I'm talking about, you guys. Become so passionately in love with someone or something that from now on, everything that you see, everything that you hear, everything that you're, that, that every conversation that you're a part of, somehow that just kind of creeps in. Because that's all you think about. That's all your heart as well as all. I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you that every time you hear from now on, somebody call somebody JJ, you're going to think of this kid right over here. <laughs> Isn't that right? Why? Because he's special to us. We love this kid. And uh, if you said Jonathan, if you said Nathan, if you said Carrie or Harley or in fact, my oldest son and his daughter had birthdays this past week. Harley and Nathan. Anytime I hear those two words, my heart goes out to my own kids. I'm not telling you not to have those other things. I'm telling you to put in perspective of love. A 
Because all that other stuff is going to go away. As a matter of fact, it says that, doesn't it? Um, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For now we know in part and prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, when love comes, when completeness comes, that which is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things behind me. For now we see only a reflection is in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known in verse 13, the one that probably ought to memorize. Okay. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of 